but this is what it looks like. The stern is a bit broken up. We think it landed stern first. It was an old vessel, 44 years old at the time, but look at that standing A-frame, the conveyor belt. And uh, when I presented this to a historian uh, that I knew, knew a bit about the evolution uh, and the history of self-unloaders, I said to this man, Bill Lafferty, do you think this might be an early self-unloader? And he said, Valerie, I think it's the world's first self-unloader. This was very interesting because we see these kind of vessels all the time. We see them coming into Holland, they come into Muskegon, they come into Ludington. Uh, Self-unloaders, which is simply a conveyor belt, rel relatively simple idea that dumps off bulk cargo without human labor. There's a diagram of how it works. But when Bill told me that he thought this was not only the Great Lakes first, but the world's first, this really piqued our interest. And of course, when you think historically, this is how cargo had to be unloaded before. You could take a small schooner, it might take a week to unload it with wheelbarrows and manpower. And so the evolution happened that we employed some steam and some little um, bucket conveyor kind of systems on pulleys that was, you know, everything is an evolution. And so this was trying to uh, 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 find a, a way to decrease manpower and increase the machine power. These unusual Hewlett unloaders, they were only seen at the big ore unloading ports uh, in the southern, uh, by Cleveland or by Chicago. These were these machines that scooped down into the holds to unload and uh, not have manpower, but these were all evolutions. Well, then um, the Hennepin was designed with a self-unloading system, and that uh, really changed the entire industry. The Hennepin was designed in 1902, and its evolution led to these thousand footers. The Stuart Court was the first thousand footer to roll off the ways in the 1970s, and it's uh, a self-unloader. You don't see the A-frame, it's all hidden on the deck and inside. But when I think about the Hennepin, and I compare the two, the humble little wooden Hennepin, only 200 feet long, and the Stuart Court, 1,000 feet long, we know that this big boat is modeled after this boat. It's really pretty amazing. And uh, the Paul R. Tregurtha today is the largest self-unloader on the Great Lakes, 1,013 feet long. You don't really get an appreciation from this view, but can you imagine watching this come into the harbor? So it was really an amazing discovery to be able to go underwater, uh, take a look at the prototypical equipment that revolutionized an industry. It's so significant that my uh, partner Bill Lafferty and I wrote a, a National Register nomination for the Hennepin, and within about a year it was on the National Register. Now you're not gonna see one of those beautiful state signs 230 feet underwater, but it is on the, it is on the register nonetheless, and it, it prompted Bill Lafferty and I to write a book that uh, really has never been written before. There have been uh, books about the evolution of sailing vessels and propeller vessels, but never about the self-unloaders. So we did that uh, last year, and we ended up winning a state history award. So um, it, it, these, these uh, discoveries have really inspired us in so many ways. Now, speaking of the self-unloaders, the um, Andaste, uh, was a, an evolution of itself. Um, uh, Latham D. Smith, a builder in Wisconsin, saw the success of the Hennepin and he decided that he would tweak it a little and he would uh, install some scrapers inside the vessel, but it, it required all this contraction on the deck uh, of, of another vessel, the Andaste. It was a, uh, an older vessel that he converted to a self-unloader. A lot of the vessels were converted. And the Andaste uh, was going, again, Grand Haven to Chicago was owned by the same people that owned the Hennepin. So when they lost the Hennepin in 1924, they bought the Andaste to continue shipping stone to Chicago, but uh, they lost it somewhere along the way. There was a huge storm. This was 1929, September 9th. Uh, monstrous 60 uh, mile an hour winds. It took them four days to realize the vessel was not just hiding in a port waiting out the wet weather. In fact, all 25 men on board perished. Many of them were crew on the day the Hennepin sank. Um, so uh, it was a major uh, news story in 1929 in September. A lot of the debris came ashore and in fact many of the bodies, 14 of the 25 bodies, came ashore. Um, some had life jackets, some didn't. This told us they had some time to realize they were in bad weather and put a life jacket on. 
Uh, but uh, we have now searched three years for the Andaste, and uh, we haven't found it. We start next week looking for it again. But what I find very interesting, take a look at this before the conversion. I'm going to zoom in right there. We're looking for, obviously, the whole vessel, but there was a name board here. We didn't find the whole vessel, but last Monday, two days ago, we found the name board. This man, Dad, had uh, been a kid walking the beach, 11 years old, 1929. He picked up this sign. The family's had it ever since. And thanks to a little media that our group got last week, I received a call from him and he says, do you want this piece? Well, my goodness, we haven't found the Andaste, but we found the name. So I thought I'd put this into the program. Uh, for me, it's what a neat touch of history. And it could be any piece of wood, but it's the wood with the name. These are lead letters that were screwed onto the wood, and you can see the, the screws helped keep this piece together. Isn't that amazing? Last story, combustion engines, modern vessels, uh, we've got radar, we've got uh, GPS, we know where we're going. It started, com combustion engines started in the early 1900s. Um, and I'm sure if you go down to the big marinas, you see yachts uh, like this, you see little motorboats, our little 21-foot boat is a combustion engine. But here's a story that reminds us that ships didn't just sink 100 years ago. This vessel, the Pizzazz, was a Florida vessel bought by a Saugatuck man. He hired uh, actually a friend of ours, Tim Murray. He's a dive store owner. He's also a captain. And he hired Tim to take the vessel up to Charlevoix. The family wanted to drive. They wanted their vessel up there when they got there. And so Tim, being a licensed captain, was hired to take the vessel up. And the, the route was going to be Saugatuck up to Charlevoix. And uh, Tim brought his son along. They were going to spend a few days in Charlevoix. Uh, father and son uh, tooling around town. And so they headed out. It was a relatively nice day on the lake, maybe one to two footers. A beautiful vessel that had just been inspected. Uh, Tim Sr. was at the helm. And uh, beautiful, you can see all the woodwork, uh, everything spick and span in order. But then a rogue wave. He rounded, this is an exaggeration, it's not an exact picture, but he rounded um, Little Sable Point and there's something weird that happens with the waves there. And uh, Tim saw three huge rollers coming at him. Again, that's exaggerated. But obviously, he wasn't taking pictures during this time. He was holding onto the wheel. Um, his son, Timmy Jr., was in the uh, salon uh, doing what kids do. He had some little video game down there. And his dad said, get up here. You've got to see these waves. And so as any good captain, he headed into the waves, better to take them with your bow over them, then your side, which could roll you over. So they headed into the waves. They braced themselves. They made it over one wave. They made it over the second wave. And they went right through the third wave. And the water gushed in from the bow. Something had cracked up front. Somebody on shore captured it. Watch that. Abandoned ship. Can you believe that? Two summers ago. And these guys were tossed into the water, father and son. And I interviewed them and actually wrote an article for a boating magazine. What was so interesting is to get inside their heads when this is going on. They had two minutes from the time the water started gushing in. And Big Tim, uh, there were some life jackets there. And he quick threw one over his shoulder, no time to snug it up. He did get one over his son. He snugged it up. And they had to make a decision when to jump. You saw him jumping there. They had to jump at the right time when the waves were a certain way. So they kind of planned it out. Uh, little Tim jumped first. Big Tim followed. Uh, they had to be sure that the boat wouldn't come around and smack him in the head, knock him out. Uh, it was warm water. They didn't have to worry about, uh, about that. But when they got in the water, Big Tim told me he's worried about his son. It's this 16-year-old boy. Uh, shore was about a mile and a half off. And when I interviewed the son, he said he was worried about dad. The life jacket wasn't um, secured. It was kind of floating around his head. Um, his dad ended up 
uh, finding a piece of wood that could help support him, but there were all kinds of nails in the wood, so he just hacked up his arm in the process. Um, another vessel had seen what happened and came around and kind of risked themselves. They were in the water 45 minutes. They were picked up, they were safe, but this fellow won't go on a boat anymore. Still happens, ships sink. It's not just a thing of the past. So um, this reminds us, this reminds any of us that get on a boat, have a good life jacket, not a little cheap junk. Life jacket, have a good type one life preserver. Uh, if the boat doesn't have one, don't get on. Um, boats sank in the past, they continue to sink today, so we have to be safe. Here's the pizzazz on the bottom. Can you imagine the captain as a diver? He went out a couple weeks later, he found the vessel. Uh, the owner wanted a few of the niceties that were still on the vessel. So this was the first summer um, after it went down. And I can tell you, they just don't build them like they used to because this is the next summer. This is 60 feet of water. Um, our 100-year-old vessels are in better shape after 100 years underwater than the pizzazz after a year underwater. Hardly recognizable anymore, but um, you just don't have the opportunity to uh, go down on a ship, get saved, and then come back and dive it. That, that just doesn't happen uh, very often. So just gives you a little, little idea. But the Chikora, we started looking for that, what, 13 years ago? We still haven't found it. We found all these other things in the process. So maybe someday I'll be back and we'll share the story. I might be old and gray and um, might not uh, talk so well anymore, but hopefully we'll be back to share that story. Thank you.